Hey everyone. Um, I, Nathan actually was on my podcast. Oh my God. Years ago. I think my first podcast, um, it feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm like, I need to have you back. Of course, you've had probably about 50 businesses between then and now, cause you're like a massive serial entrepreneur. <laughs> so okay. I'm excited to have you back. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Definitely been through, uh, through some things, but I mean, being an entrepreneur is fun. You're yeah. always in doing new adventures and new projects. Right. Never boring. Um, and so you've had like free up. Um, I remember that well. And of course you grew it to like millions and then sold it. And you've got, um, uh, sorry, I just forget the e-com. Ecom Balance. It's a monthly bookkeeping service yeah. and, and a second brand accounts balance that's for non-e-commerce businesses. Perfect. And Outsource School, which we're going to be talking today about because obviously with podcasting between launching, promoting, editing, producing, there are so many things to do. And to me, I couldn't do it without my team. And um people need support. You can't do it all on, on your own. Um, so right. what made you start doing, like you obviously got out of free up. So what made you do outsourcing school? Yeah. So, I mean, we sold free up in November, 2019. So yeah. the original plan was to take a year off, travel the world and um, kind of enjoy the, the fruits of our hard work. And yes. a few months later, the pandemic hit, which was unexpected. So that kind of changed everything. Seriously, right? We, we were stuck at home with nothing to do, no business to run. And we didn't really have any like new business ideas. And we weren't really ready to like start another free up or another like service-based business yet. So a, a few friends of ours reached out and said, Hey, um, you guys have some really good hiring processes. Uh, if you taught that to other people, they would get a lot of benefit out of it. And, and we didn't really know we created a, a beta course called cracking the VA code and did a little beta launch and, and thought of people wanted to see if people were interested. And yeah. to be honest, if people hated it, we were just going to refund them and, and move on to something else. And yeah. luckily people really liked it. And, and that kind of took off to where we were able to kind of take all our SOPs, everything that we've done in our businesses from customer service to podcast, to you name it, and kind of add that to, to outsource school where it's kind of became a, a membership where members get access to our hiring process and, and all the SOPs that, that we have for all of our businesses. So it kind of was a little pandemic baby. <laughs> That's hilarious. I have two dogs for that, but, and you have a company. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that is perfect because obviously with you having free up, that was the base of your business. Um, you would have totally have those dialed in. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I find that a lot of entrepreneurs when it's just them and then they start to grow, they absolutely resist getting support and hiring help. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, hiring is that that really unsexy part of, of being an entrepreneur. They don't teach you it in business school. No. A lot of people don't focus on it. They're you're so obsessed with marketing and branding and sales and and, and hiring kind of gets overlooked. And mm -hmm. I think I learned early on when I was running my Amazon business in college and I was doing everything myself and the business was growing and I was working nights and weekends. And at some point I just realized like I couldn't scale if I wasn't going to hire people. And, yeah. and, and then you also realize that making bad hires is expensive. Turnovers is expensive. It, it crushes you. It sets you back. And what every entrepreneur needs is, is a good hiring process that results in good hires that stick around for a high percentage of time. And without that, you're, you're only going to get so far as an entrepreneur. There, there's very few seven, eight figure entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that are doing everything themselves. It just doesn't exist. So you you kind of have to learn how to hire one way yeah. or another, and it's either going to be something that hold you, hold you back or or accelerates you forward. And I kind of got thrown into it as a young age, and spent a lot of time just building a really good hiring process that we use with with all of our companies. Yeah, wholeheartedly. And I've seen clients hire, and like the turnover, and like the stress, and then start the feeling of like starting from scratch, like. It's brutal and it will take its toll. And I don't know if you know this, but um, when I started my business, it was just me and I was a VA and then I grew a VA firm and then content marketing and then morphed into niche into podcasting. So that whole VA space, I'm totally familiar with 
and the hiring, it's it, it takes skill. You can't just wing it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I mean, if you look at free app, um, like obviously we had thousands of freelancers on the platform, but our internal team was 30 virtual assistants in the Philippines. We had no office, yeah. no us employees. They were running an eight figure business, doing everything from customer service to sales, to billing and collecting payments and paying people to doing our content our blogs and our podcasts that we had before we sold it. So they were just running every little aspect of the company and, and, and working hundreds of hours every yeah. week. I couldn't have worked that many hours, even if I wanted to. So I know, right? um, it, it's something that can really help you grow a business if you know how to do it properly. And, and, and you get really solid people from, from day one that are good at the things that you're not good at, that can do the things that aren't a good use of your time. That's how you really scale a business wholeheartedly i yeah and and i even have a hard time delegating because i'm a bit of a control freak myself and i do i'm i do something and i'm like why am i doing this like it's it's funny how your brain messes you up like that now so that to me is like okay that when i think oh i could probably pass that off that's a sign that i need to hire someone to take that off my plate but like some entrepreneurs like how do you know when you're ready to hire yeah. So, I mean, we have a VA calculator that can tell you from a, a money side when you can afford to hire. Mm -hmm. If you go to outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator, you can plug in the numbers of your business and it'll tell you how many VAs you can afford. Um, and, and that's important. But the other side of it is you have to understand that there's three different types of hires. There's followers, doers, and experts. And mm -hmm. followers are, are your virtual assistant. They, they might have years of experience. I like hiring people with years of experience, but they're there to follow your systems, your processes. If, I, if I'm hiring for customer service, I want someone with five years of customer service experience, but then I'm going to teach them my way of doing customer service. I'm not just going to say, go do your thing on my, my customers. Yeah. I'm going to teach them how to do it. The, the doers are, are more your specialists, your graphic designers, writers, stuff like that. You're not teaching someone to be a graphic designer. They're doing the same thing eight to 10 hours a day. Building a Rolodex of doers is incredibly important because you can bring them from business to business. Every time you need a website, every time you need a, a logo, you don't want to have to start hiring and interviewing. You want to have reliable people that you can just go to. And then you got the experts, the high level um, people that, that have their own systems, their own process, their own way to do things. And that's great for things that, that aren't a good use of your time to, to learn. Like I could spend the next six months learning Facebook ads as an yeah. entrepreneur, that's a bad use of my time. And Absolutely. it's much better to just hire someone to, that knows what they're doing from day one and kind of understanding those three hires will really help you understand when the, the right time for something is. When you've mastered a process, but you need to spend time on other stuff, that's when you hire a follower. When you have a project that needs to get done, that's when you hire a specialist. And when something comes up that you're not an expert in, that's when you need that expert. I love that. And so many people don't think of that right away. And I learned that kind of as I went. So like I would hire and then realize that they're a follower and I had to like feed them stuff, create that manual, create those processes. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have time for this. And then I realized that I needed to hire doers and then like when to hire an expert and, and what kind of scenarios. So I think understanding that right off the bat is absolutely key. Now, I, for me in the VA business we, way back when, I found that people would come to me and they're like, oh, I need support. I need a VA. But I'm like, great. What are you looking to outsource? And they have no clue, Nathan. And I'm like, okay, you need help, but you don't know what. Like, do you see that a lot? Yeah. I mean, there's so many different tasks that, that you can outsource. And um, I mean, a good starting point is to create a list of, of all the different things that you do in your business and order them from easiest to hardest. And yeah. you, I mean, hiring people takes trust. It's a big first step to take something off your plate. So start with an easy task that if they mess up, um, it's not that big of a deal. Podcast pitching, which we have the podcast outreach formula, which is very popular um, at Outsource School. It's a great first task to start someone with yeah. because worst case scenario, you don't get on some podcasts, you get rejected. Best case scenario, you learn how to delegate, you learn how to give directions. Um, all of that is, is incredibly important. So um, that's kind of how I would start. Start at the easiest task, hire someone for five hours a week, 10 hours a week. You're going to learn about hire, a lot about hiring and delegating. And um, yeah, that, that's just a great place to start. I agree. And yeah, writing the list and kind of understanding where you're, you're spending your time. 
so obviously you had 30 employees under your belt with running free up and so forth. And obviously had a ton working for other people. What were some of the biggest lessons that you learned in building that up? Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of just treating people well and getting them yeah. to be motivated with the company. I, I, like the hardest part of selling free up was our internal team. We had to tell them they couldn't work with us anymore and transition it out and, and kind of lose people that we had great relationships with. And, yeah. and we tried to treat them well. Like part of the deal was making sure their jobs were secure. And we took $500,000 and gave it to our team in the Philippines and wanted to, to make sure that they were taken care of. But the way that like we want our, our everyone we hire to feel a part of the business that they're owners that it's, they're, it's their baby they're part of the success and failure and you can do that by sharing goals you can do that by helping having them create a company culture we just had a happy hour meeting before this to wrap up the new year um where everyone kind of showed appreciation of each other nice. um we we want everyone to feel a part of the family and that they, they succeed or, or fail with us and, and that's one just great way to to reduce turnover, which we kind of talked about as expensive, but it also is a great way to get a lot out of people. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs fall in the trap where they say, hey, you do this task and and that's not motivating. That only gets you so far and, and it's tough to build a, a company, a culture and environment around that. I totally agree. It's like you don't want it to be transactional. You want it to be relationships. Um, yeah, I adore my team. I know what's going on in their personal lives. It's like, sure, you you want to, you know, create some barriers, but boundaries. But I think you you need to build those relationships. And how did you do that in such a big company, though? Like that would be harder to do, I find. Yeah, I mean, you start you start small, right? Like we didn't just wake up one day and hire thirty people. Yeah, we yeah. Had totally. a, a few people that we started with, and and those first hires are key. You want first hires who are going to stick with you and yeah. be the veteran and help new people adjust and set expectations. So those four first hires were key. We had Chicky Ann who ran recruitment, Marius who did billing, Jane and Layden who did customer service and, and working with the freelancers, and so we had kind of had this great core of people that we got them to believe we got them to buy in. We set up incentives where their pay went up as the business grew. And then we built the team around them. We taught them how to manage. We taught them how to lead. We put people underneath them. We taught them how to evaluate people and let us know when someone needs to be fired. So by having that core, really strong core group that really yeah. believes in what we're doing, that allowed us to, to kind of take a step back, focus on other things, get other people in there. And, and that's what really made the difference at the end of the day. Yeah, that's great advice. Now, what were some of the challenges that you had um, with the hiring and interviewing yeah, I mean, whenever you start a marketplace, you kind of have a chicken or egg situation, right? You're like, well, what comes first, the clients or the freelancers? How do you always make sure that you have enough freelancers? Obviously, you want to add clients because that's sales. So that that's always a, a balancing act and you're kind of running two forms of marketing for each each group. So that was always a challenge. It's something that you'd have times where you were on top of it, times where one side would, would fall behind. Um, but that's something that you're kind of always aware of. And, and then you kind of have the, the software side that holds it all together um, that my business partner really handles with our developers because that's my least favorite part of, of any business. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you kind of have this thing that, that kind of ties everything together. And I mean, what the other thing to remember is what works at 1 million doesn't work at 5 million and what works at 5 million doesn't work at 10 million. And yeah. so when you hit these benchmarks, you have to learn how to delegate more. You have to learn how to put people in charge of their own teams and have, you can't be the only one solving problems and putting out fires. You got to teach other people to do that. And, and so as your business grows, you have to really take a hard look at not only your team and, and make sure that you have the right people in the right seats, but also just the overall structure of your organization and make sure that it's going to work when you hit that next level. Yeah, that's a great point. And like when you're a solo entrepreneur and you're building and hire, like your processes have to change your procedures, your it, it. Yeah. I've gone through that a couple of times. It's been painful, but good in the long run, but it's tough to growing is painful sometimes, but good in the end. Absolutely. Um, every company goes through growing pains. Yeah. I mean, we're going through that now with econ balance and nothing's like terrible or off the wall, yeah. but there, there's things that you, you kind of figure out in your first year and second year in business. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. So when someone is looking to outsource, whether it's a podcast, content marketing, their social, whatever, um, what are some tips that you would give in that interviewing process? Because as you said, getting good hires. You don't just want a warm body in the seat, so to speak. You want someone that can help you grow. 
Yeah, I mean, we focus on skill, attitude, and communication with every hire. And I think where a lot of entrepreneurs go wrong is they just focus on the skill. They just focus on the experience. This person's got five years of customer service experience, but you want that that full picture. You want someone who has great communication skills, especially if you're hiring in the Philippines or Mm -hmm. from other cultures. Um, You want people who have a great attitude that don't just care about money, that want to be part of your culture and be a good team player and and care about the success of your business. So Mm -hmm. we're really looking for that trifecta and anything we hire. And it can't just be one out of three. It can't just be two out of the three. And we have what we call our care interview process that we teach nice. at Outdoor School, which is um, communication, attitude, red flags, and experience. And we, we kind of talked about three of them. The red flags is you're looking for every possible thing this person says that shows they don't have the right attitude. They don't have the great communication skills. They don't have the experience you need. And a lot of people go through interviews the wrong way. They're looking for the right answers. They're looking for the the boil plate templates. Um, We're looking for the wrong answers. We're looking for what is this person saying that that's a red flag for us. I love that. And you're so correct. Like looking at the skills, you need to look at their personality. I know for me, I want to hire someone that I like that. I feel like our personalities are going to match a little bit so that it's a good working relationship for both of us and wholeheartedly on the communication style. And everyone's a little bit different, right? Nathan, like on what their needs, like what one of my clients wants and what they look for in communication might be different than my needs. So you kind of have to like know what you're looking for. Yeah. And you kind of like every business is different. Every business has a different culture. Like you might be in real estate where it's more cutthroat and you need someone who can, can be that, that tough person there. And my, I've never run a business that way. Our, our culture is a little bit more relaxed and team friendly and caring and appreciation, but you want to find someone that, that actually fits your business and your culture that you're trying to build. There's no, I mean, there, there's bad cultures, but most of the time there there's just different cultures and you want to find people that are a good fit for what you're building. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find it it's easier to start with like the job description of like mapping all those things out that you do want? Or is that kind of like a nice to have or? Yeah. I mean, we have job posting templates. We, we give an outsource school that are kind of good starting points. And you kind of got to remember, you got to you got to look for that that skill attitude experience but then when it comes to skill wise like you don't want to teach people different levels like a good example i always give is we had this client at free up who ran a, a e-commerce business for um, selling car parts. So he wanted to hire customer service reps. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to teach someone cars, teach someone customer service, and then teach them how he wanted it done. He wants someone who already knew cars and liked cars, had years of customer service experience, had the right skill, attitude, communication, and then you would teach them that last step. So that's kind of a good way to think about job posting. Yeah. You want to make it as easy as possible um, for you to, to get someone from point A to point B and for you to be able to realize whether they're going to fit or not. Because in that first 30 days that you're hiring someone, that's when you're evaluating them. That's when you want to decide, hey, is this person an A player, a B player, a C mm-hmm. player? And you don't want to have to take months and months to, to figure that out. Yeah, ain't that the truth? So if I'm hiring someone, what should I do before I hit that button and start interviewing? Like, do I need to have all of my processes dialed in? Do I need like, because I know some people have just winged it and then it flops. And then some people put it off hiring because they feel like they have to have like a whole procedure manual or whatever. Like, what do we actually need? Yeah. SOP, a standard operating procedure. You shouldn't hire a follower. You shouldn't hire a VA unless you've done a process before it and you know how to do it. You don't want to hire someone for your e-commerce business and say, go find me profitable products. That's not how it works. You have to have a a good system for doing research or finding leads or getting on podcasts or or whatever you're hiring um, that person for. And and a good way to, to, you don't need a perfect SOP, but you need at least a solid rough draft that breaks down the goals, the the why you're doing something, the steps, what do you do first, second, and third, and then the, the red flags, the things to be aware of, the things not to do for any reason. Like, do not pitch me on podcasts that don't accept guests because that's a waste of time. So yeah. you need kind of those reminders in there. And once you have that SOP and you obviously have the budget, which you can use the VA calculator for, that's when you can start that hiring process. And as the VA goes through it, you can make that SOP better and better over time. You don't want... A, a not a hundred percent SOP to hold you back, but you need at least something before you can start the process. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it'll just make you want to set them up for success, right? And you want less stress on you and obviously less stress on them um, so that it all works smoothly. When do you, here's a good question. When do you know when someone that you have hired is not working? Yeah. So here are kind of the factors that, that you want to look at. Um, first of all, what is their potential? Once you work with someone like best case scenario, are they going to be an A player, a B player, or a C player? That's something that you got to figure out early on, um, how quickly they learn, how they problem solve, how good they are. Once you actually see them in action, you want to figure that out because if, so, if best case, someone's going to be a B player, you're going to treat that differently than, Hey, this person just needs some help, but they could be an A player. Um, number two is how much time you've invested in them. If you notice in week one, they're going to be a B player, that's a good time to part ways. If you have invested two months into someone and best case, they're a B player, you've got a little bit tougher decision to make. Um, and then third, what is like the effect on your business if you make that move? If you yeah. if you have someone that has the best case scenario that they're a B player, but you're in busy season and you're, they're an integral part of your business and letting them go is going to hurt you, you need to create a really good plan for that. So you want to kind of look at those factors. In general, you want to part ways earlier than later and you want to kind of avoid risk. If you're not sure whether someone's an A player and they're struggling on th some things, let them go early. If someone's been with you a while and they used to be an A player and they're um, for whatever reason they're not doing it anymore, that that might be something where you give them a little bit more leeway. You sit down with them. I've had situations where someone was just burnt out and I just had to give them a week off and then they came yeah. back and they were an A player. So those are kind of the, the factors I look at. Yeah, I love that. And even your point about like like talk communicating right with the other person. I've had the same situation where I was like, what's going on, man? Like, this is not working out. And then you realize that like, oh, this is and this is happening. It's like, OK, take a step back, get your stuff in order and then come back and then we'll try a new process. What's working? What's not working? Um, I mean, who knows? Sometimes the problem is you and you just your processes don't make sense to them or who knows what. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and it could be a chance for you to look at your SOP and, and yeah. just make it better before you get started with someone. For sure. So many pieces. Um, do you have any interview questions that you're like, oh, you should ask these three things or whatever that you find really pulls that information out of people? You yeah, always I mean, think, like you always think, oh, what are your strengths and weaknesses? But I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I hate those freaking questions. No, I mean, we have a whole list of interview questions that, that we provide for, for people at Outsource School. I mean, we like to focus on the, their personal life. What do they do for fun? Are they reading books and learning? Are they uh, like, what, what's going on in their personal life? What do they enjoy doing um, outside of work? Um, we always like to, to go through their, their setup where we live in the higher uh, the, or the era of hiring remote. How old is their laptop? What kind of internet and power oh. connections do they have? Um, stuff like that. So, so we're on top of that. Um, knowing why they left past jobs jobs, asking yeah. them what their perfect job looks like. What, mm. like, what is their ideal situation to make sure it's a, a match? Like those are, are, are just a few, but we have a whole thing that we recommend people that you ask for, for any interview. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because sometimes you're like, you hire and then as you're going through, you know, the next month or whatever, you're like, Oh, I should have asked this, <laughs> write that down for the next person. Yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately through life, you, you know, learn mistakes. So to have like an outsourcing school where you're like, okay, understand the interview process, the onboarding process. It's going to like set you up because those are skills that are going to stay with you and help you grow and scale. So what does the outsource school, like what elements does it cover? Yeah. So it's our, it, the core of it is what we call cracking the VA code, which is our exact yeah. process for interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing that you can just plug right in your business from day one and improve your hires and keep people around. And once you've mastered our hiring process, then we have all our SOPs that are very dependent on what you care about. If you're trying to go on podcasts, if you're trying to do lead generation, uh, if you're oh, trying okay. to hire writers, if you're trying to create a customer service system. So all our exact SOPs are in there for you to use um, as kind of bonuses. But the main thing is how we interview, onboard, train, and manage. Absolutely. And it's funny how some entrepreneurs I find, oh, if I hire someone, they, they can just go wing it and run with it. And I don't need to do any training, but like for it's like, how important is training? 
Yeah. I mean, if you remember followers, doers, and experts, yeah. if you're hiring a follower, there's training. There's no way around it. You're going to have to train and the better and more efficient you are at training, that's how you're going to grow your business. The The reason we are able to sell free up is we had SOPs for every single part of the business, customer service, lead gen, billing clients, and a training process for any new hire to go through. Um, and, and that should be the core of any company. Absolutely. And I find too, like training, I, I've been through, you know, my share of employees and so forth. It's like everyone learns differently. Like sometimes I can do a loom and have steps and give it to someone and they're good. And someone just glazes over it. And I actually have to like step them through it. It's so, it, it you feel like you almost have to set up the training like three different ways or something. Do you have any tricks up your sleeve? Yeah. I mean, I, my advice is don't do videos early on in your company because they just get outdated very quickly as you change your mm -hmm. processes. So I prefer documents. Documents are easy to edit, especially if you're hiring your first VA to go through the process, you're going to have changes. You're going to have adjustments and yeah. the documents makes it a lot easier. The videos you can adjust later on and make them down the line. But that's kind of my tip. Um, we also have them study the SOP and, and ask questions. We test them on it. We have them watch us do it if, if we're making the video. Uh, so kind of getting ahead of it where we don't even yeah. start until the person shows us they read and understood the SOP. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. So it's like you have a whole onboarding process, clearly. Right, exactly. Yeah. And what about managing? Are there things that we should like categories of things that we need to look at when we're managing a team? Yeah, how you run meetings is key. We have Monday all hands meetings. Um, we have performance meetings one on one. Um, mm -hmm. Setting up the right communication channels. How do we use Slack? How do we use yeah. email? That gets overlooked by a lot of people. Um, setting the right expectations, whether it's schedule, whether it's communication, whether it's how how often we respond to clients. Like th those things are incredibly important. And um, putting like team leaders in place as you get bigger is a, another big key of managing. I know. I find honestly that part the hardest. It's like, it's fine having all the team, but to have someone else manage other people, that feels like a next level. Do you know what I mean? Of growth and scaling. And I, I don't know, for me anyways, I find a block when it comes to that part. Like what tip can you give me, Nathan? That part's hard. In terms of getting like adding team leaders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like to promote from within. That's a, a big thing that can help you. It, yeah. It's not impossible to hire managers or team leaders from the outside. It's just, um, it, it, there's just risk. Like you got to get the people that you already have to accept an outsider as a leader. And then that outsider has to prove that they understand your company and, yeah. and that they're a good fit. So a lot just has to go right. Um, I always look for people who want to be leaders, who I can promote from within, who have the respect of the other people on the team. That's always best. Yeah. Um, like with Econ Balance, we we have leaders and, and I'm, I'm having number twos on each team that can slowly be training to become a leader. So I'm always kind of training that next leader and that's important. And, um, like SOPs, which we talked about, you should have an SOP for being a team leader. We provide it in outsource school. Um, this is what you do. This is how you communicate. This is yeah. what's expected of you. This is how, what we grade you on. So all those are just a, a few tips. I can't believe how much you have in that outsource school. That's crazy. <laughs> and to have all the SOPs from your company that you obviously built successfully and scaled, um, what killer assets. And there's all like, again, like so many moving parts, growing a business, growing a team. It's like, you know, you're good at coaching or you're good at doing Facebook ads, but you never think about all those nuances. Yeah. I mean, it's, I kind of focus on the, the two unsexy things, the hiring and the finances, and it's the, the core of every company. You have yeah. to, you have to do it well if you want to scale. Um, but a lot of people do it poorly. I know. I love that. Um, I find too, uh, in this sort of the beginning, but it's like for entrepreneurs getting in that mindset that it like to outsource. Cause I find it's easy to be like, Oh, only I can do it the right way. Or, you know, if I outsource, I'm going to make less money or like, there's all like this head trash before you even start opening up your mind to outsourcing. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's all things you have to get over. That's chapter one in, in cracking the VA code, like <laughs> all, all the myths. And I remember like for me, I, I when I had my first business and I was making money for the first time and my yeah. parents said, you should probably pay taxes. So I met with an accountant. And the first thing he asked me is, when are you going to hire your first person? And I gave all those excuses that they're going to hurt yeah. my business. Why would I do that? That's cost me money. They're going to steal my ideas. How can I trust other people? And he just laughed in my face. And I went through my, my first busy season and just got destroyed. I was working 20 hours a day and and my life, my social life suffered, my, my personal life suffered. And I kind of, I got through and I learned a hard lesson and I said, okay, I got to hire people. So you're going to learn that lesson one way or another. You you might as well get over those fears now. I know. I love it. And I find like, as soon as you offload something or you hire another person, you're just like, your shoulders drop. You're like, Ooh, okay. That feels so good. And then delegating becomes addictive. (laughs) It does. That's a great point. It, 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 once you do it right and you realize, yeah. hey, that customer service task that I hate doing that I've been doing for the past six months, I don't have to do it anymore. That's when it becomes addicting. I know. Right. For sure. I love it. You have so many good tips and to have that resource of helping out with outsourcing to do it the right way to train all of it. Um, where do people go to enroll in the school and get those tips? And of course, I'll have that VA calculator link in the show notes as well. Yeah. Go to outsourceschool.com. It's all there. If you want our calculator, it's outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator. Um, feel free to find me on social media and yeah. Nathan Hirsch on any social media channel. And if you're interested on the bookkeeping side, econ balance and accounts balance, um, both.com are, are, are available to you as well. Yeah. So what are you building next, Nathan? This is it. This is my focus right now. Outsource school <laughs> and my I'm two bookkeeping you. services. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. You've got enough on your plate, boy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing. And um, I hope people, more people outsource and grow and scale for 2023. And I appreciate your help and your tips. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. All right. See ya.